Welcome to The Craft. I'm your host, Mae Globus. This podcast is a collection of intimate conversations on artistry, mastery, and life with talented, passionately curious creatives and entrepreneurs. Most are dear friends, some are those I've admired from afar. I hope you enjoy these conversations, this exploration of the humanity that connects all of us as much as I do having them. Thank you for being here and for listening. This episode is sponsored by Happy Fox Health, a natural supplement brand focused on sea moss, a marine algae that has 92 out of 102 essential nutrients that your body needs to thrive and regenerate. I've used a number of their products and found it's really given me clarity of mind. Visit happyfoxhealth.com and use promo code THECRAFT for an exclusive 15 to 20% discount off your first product purchase. As a number of you know, I'm also a certified sound therapy practitioner and founder of Oto Healing, a sound therapy studio and practice. Sound has been a healing modality through many cultures for thousands of years. Oto's approach to sound is rooted in both art and science, the art being the history of sound, the science being quantum physics, biology, brainwave states, and more. All listeners of the show get 15% off their first private one-hour session. Visit otohealing.com to book yours now. Marlon Thompson is a truly wonderful human who is building a better, more inclusive business world. His passion for bringing equity, community, and education to the venture capital space led him to launch Future Capital in 2020, alongside being a partner at LOI Venture. In a former chapter, he was also a spin instructor and a Lululemon ambassador. He was born in Scarborough, Ontario, raised by a single mother in the Melbourne neighborhood. It was an area with a range of diversity, with many ethnicities, cultures, and cuisines in one place. Precocious and mischievous, he was a rule breaker as a young child, something he eventually grew out of as a teen. But being an entrepreneur today, being a bit of a rule breaker still rings true. Marlon began his career journey in retail as a manager at Amber Crombie & Fitch before making his way to Vancouver after accepting a retail operations role at Indochino. He found himself in venture capital after a natural conclusion to his retail career, landing a role at the next big thing, running an accelerator program for a new generation of entrepreneurs. Particularly interested in the financial side, he began to see a pattern of funding and capital lack that became a barrier to entrepreneurs looking to scale their businesses. In this conversation, we talked about the challenges he observed his single black mother go through, what working in retail taught him about managing complexity, the current landscape of venture capital and how diversity leads to better businesses, extra pressures of being quote unquote, the first POC in a room and at the table, what code switching means and its roots in survival, understanding angel, LP and syndicate levels in the investment space, the importance of financial literacy and actionable steps, what to look for in an investor for your business, how he's taking care of himself in the wake of recently losing his mother, and much more. Please enjoy this deeply informative, free-flowing conversation with the smart and lovely Marlon Thompson. Marlon Thompson, welcome to The Craft. (laughs) Hello. So nice to have you in here. Yeah, thank you for having me. This is uh, is super exciting. Yes, yes. Our dear mutual friend Amanda Lee Smith introduced us, and uh, she was sending me a whole bunch of people that she's like, you need to chat with all these people and uh, you were on there and I'm so glad that she did we had a lovely lovely conversation last week nice way to get to know one another yeah I'm a big Amanda Amanda fan me too I think everybody is you've got a cheering squad over here Amanda (laughs) yeah totally uh how are you feeling today Uh, that's a good question I'm feeling very frenetic today (laughs) yeah yeah I'm feeling um all over the place and I'm embracing that feeling yeah. Mm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> How are you feeling? Ah, no one's ever asked me that. Uh, I am feeling, I'm feeling more centered than I have been in the last couple of days. And the reason why I'm feeling that is because I realized that for the past five or six months, there were certain rituals that I would do every morning that I'd fallen off of. Okay. One of them being before I get into the shower for two years without 
ever really missing a day, I would ecstatic dance to some song in front of the mirror. <laughs> and they get into the shower. And over the last five or six months, I stopped doing it. And I started again just a couple of days ago. And I'm feeling much better. I'm feeling much more in my body. I feel like when you dance like that, ecstatic dance meaning I would put on a, a tribal song, okay. basically. I was, I was going to ask you what the music yeah. like, inspiring that dance was going to be. Yes. So I'm, I'm, Typically, it's tribal songs, but okay. I will, I'll see how I feel. So today was Cuff It by Beyonce. <laughs> Stop it. I, <laughs> I, I actually listened to that song this morning as well. Did you? Not in the shower, but basically the same thing. So yes. I'm okay, right there with you. <laughs> yes. It's so good. You just, yeah. you really feel yourself when you, when you dance to that song. So today the song had lyrics, but it, I feel like it's a great way to be in your body. Yeah. And maybe move some things out that yes. you don't realize are there. I have no idea if you know this, but I used to be a spin instructor. I did read that <laughs> did somewhere. Did you know that? Yes, yes. And um, I definitely used those kind of like, every time I would teach a class or take a class, that kind of um, intense, like high intensity movement, um, I think like really, really helped me to feel centered. I just remember feeling like so calm after every one of those classes because mm. of that just like, yeah, really, really high intensity push. Yeah. So I imagine that you get a little bit of that in, in the morning when you yes. do your, your frenetic yeah, definitely. dance. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. But thank you for asking that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. So I'd love to go back way, way back in time. Not way back. Yeah. I don't know why I said it that way, but <laughs> just back into your history and you were born in Scarborough. I was. Yes, um, which is near Toronto. Yeah. And I'd love to know what that was like for you. Yeah, I was born in Scarborough, General. Um, and the earliest part of my life was uh, in Scarborough. Um, if anybody listening knows the hood, I was, I was in Malvern. <laughs> um, and so... Yeah, it's weird. I don't. I don't have a ton of childhood memories. Um, I like a lot of my early childhood is a blur to me. Like I remember these like, very specific moments. So I don't know exactly what it was like for me. I don't think that's like a good indicator. <laughs> I don't think that means I, I, um, you know, cherish a lot of those moments. But I think being from that part of Ontario and just um, you know we lived in like lower income housing and. Um, we were definitely um, all hustling as a family to make ends meet and to make everything work. I think that has really informed who I am today, and um, it's informed the work that I do. It's informed, you know, my worldview. So, yeah, I think you know my childhood was challenging in many ways, but um, I think I'm better for it, to be completely honest. Mm. Yeah, it was a very diverse place to to grow totally. up. Totally. Right? Yes, I feel like. <laughs> I've, I've been in Vancouver now for almost a decade and um, I can't help but do the thing that everybody does, which is compare Toronto and Vancouver. And yeah, I really cher like I just really appreciate and value the diversity that exists in Ontario, especially in Toronto and Scarborough. I think like Scarborough is its own thing for sure. It's I, I feel like there's like these really big pockets of immigrants and um, like many generations of immigrant families. And so the, the culture is like really deeply rooted into the, the city or the city of Scarborough and like these different um, areas. And so, yeah, there's like Indian culture, there's tons of Caribbean people there. There's everything really like a lot, there's a, a really big mix. And I miss that. I do miss that a lot. I don't miss a lot of things about Toronto, but that's one of the things that I really um, mm. envy. Yeah, I, I spent quite a lot of time in Toronto in the fall of 2020 okay. after I, I left my corporate job. Mm. And that was one of the things that I noticed about Toronto was yeah. just an in incredible rainbow of yeah. cultures and food, like yes. cuisines that we don't have here. Mm -hmm. um, like for example, a lot of Tibetan food, yeah. which I don't see where much of it here that? I'm yeah. like where can I get momos here <laughs> and so some people were telling me you go you can go to Coquitlam that makes and sense. Yeah. Surrey yeah. for that but uh yeah definitely one of the things I, I really really 
love about that city. Yeah, is I've that. been I've been searching far and wide for <laughs> some really good Trini- Trinidadian food. Yeah. In uh, Vancouver, and the search continues. And it continues. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you been to Baby Do- Baby Doll? No. On commercial? No. I haven't even heard of it. Yes, so is, there you go. <laughs> that's a serendipitous. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, might be going there, there right after this because I'm I, like, it's a high thing. It's high on my priority list. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Baby doll is so great. And the owner, I forget his name, but he's so, so nice and he's usually okay. there. So there cool. you go. Cool. Lunch. Exciting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to report back and let you know. <laughs> yes, please do. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your parents and what they were like. Yeah. Um, uh, my, I grew up in a single, um, parent household. So my mom was a single mother and, you know, she <laughs> was, uh, devout, was devoutly religious and, um, even more devoutly, um, in love with her children. <laughs> so, um, she, yeah, she was really, um, a big influence for, for me, um, growing up and all through my life. And, um, yeah, she recently passed away. So, um, speaking of her is, uh, emotional, um, and, uh, healthy as well. So I'm glad you asked, (laughs) um, because I am constantly thinking of her at the moment. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I've gone like, I've gone through a journey in terms of like figuring out how to talk about <laughs> myself as a, like a feminist or not a feminist, and I am. Um, but um, I think a lot of that comes from my experience, you know, growing up with a single mother, and just like m- understanding and observing the challenges, especially for you know my mom, who was a woman of color, um, navigating this world, <laughs> and and. Um, trying to create a life for herself and for her family. And so, yeah, I think the impact that she had on me is so um, monumental. Mm. Yeah. What was her spirit like? <laughs> she was really joyous. <laughs> I'm really happy you asked that question because um, one of the things that I've experienced in in like um, in the wake of, of losing my mother is having a fuller, clearer view of who she was, I think, a lot of our relationships with our parents are complex um, for many, many different reasons. That was definitely the case for me and my mom. Um, but, you know, um, in hindsight and looking back at, you know, her life and who she was and how she impacted people, there was just this, like, smile that I can see on her face that was so infectious. Um, and I think she was also really generous, like, really, really giving um maybe sometimes too generous. Um, uh, but yeah, I think she gave a lot and created a lot and did a lot with, with very little. Um, and so I think her spirit, spirit was, yeah, just really, um, really generous. Mm. Yeah. In what ways are you like her? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're different in a lot of ways, to be completely honest. But I think, um, like, I think I get my sense of humor from her. I think um, my kind of innate ability to create and foster and nurture community comes from her, for sure. And I think it's also, it's, it's, it's her, but it's also, you know, like, um, our Caribbean background. My mom Trin- was Trinidadian. She is Trinidadian. Um, and, um, yeah, I think there's, yeah, there's a sense of community that's built into, um, you know, our heritage. And, um, I think I get that from her as well. Mm. And I think I'm also very stubborn, like my mom. (laughs) Yeah. I think we both, we both share that. Mm. I feel like so many people are stubborn yeah <laughs> I feel like yeah. everyone's always sort of like oh like there are things <laughs> that they just can't like go home. it also might, might be when you think of your parents like that's the most stubborn those are like that I feel like a lot of the times those are stop very stubborn relationships mm-hmm. because there's just so much projection that happens yeah, that's <laughs> and so, so true and so yeah there's always like some sort of a 
tension. I'm I'm speaking very universally, but I'm just I think more often than not that that can be the case. Oh, I'm sure that it, that would people. resonate with so yeah. many people. <laughs> yeah. It resonates with me very deeply. Okay, yeah, right okay. now, for sure, <laughs> so for not sure, alone. <laughs> you're not alone. Tell me about what you were like as a child <laughs> and as a teen. Oh my goodness, I I think I was a very precocious, annoying kid that like was. Um, just ahead of himself all the time <laughs> and like wanted to say I remember always wanting to sit at the adults table because the kids were boring I still kind of feel that way like I, <laughs> most of my like friends that I keep close to me are um if, if I haven't known them for like 25 years they're like five ten years older than me mm. <laughs> so I've always been just like a little bit older than my age and I think that was definitely true as a child I think people that didn't know me back then would be surprised to hear that I was really deviant. Like I got in so much trouble <laughs> all the time. What kind I, of trouble? Just like, you know, I remember one time I got suspended from school for lighting a match in class, which is so stupid. Like, why would you do that? You, you know, like stuff like that, like never anything um, that was, you know, really serious or, right. um, you know, affected anyone else, just like mischief. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah. you were just mischievous. I was just a shit disturber. And like <laughs> a lot of my friends were, were like that as well. But I was also, I think, okay, I think I, like I see, I would see rules and I'd be like, that's a pointless rule, I'm going to break it. And like it was that kind of mentality where um, I had to like really respect an authority, a figure, or respect um, a guideline to follow it, <laughs> which is... I, which I don't recommend. Like, in hindsight, that was probably really annoying for, like, my parents or my mom and, and you know, you know the, the teachers that were tasked with rearing me as a child. Yeah. Yeah. Is that still a, a rule you sort of abide by? There's a rule, so. I'm going to break it? I think it's, it's like, I'm, I'm definitely more discerning, um, but I think I still have to really respect... Um, a rule <laughs> in order to follow so, it. Yeah. So you're not lighting matches in meetings anymore. Not lighting matches in meetings <laughs> unless there's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm going to burn this place down. Yeah, I'm not doing anything like to just draw attention or anything, but I definitely still, I mean, one of the things that I think a lot of entrepreneurs say, but, and, and believe, and is true for a lot of entrepreneurs, but one of the things that is definitely true for me is, I was never really like a great employee anywhere because and I just had my own way of doing things and um, would run on my own schedule. And so, you know, in, in those ways, I think I'm still that like mischievous um, version of myself, just just more discerning because I understand like you have to keep a job and you have to like pay taxes, you know, right. you, you have yeah. to do certain things, even though um, you might not believe in the thing itself or you might not believe in you know, the rule. Mm. And did that rebellious kind of mischievous streak in you, mm -hmm. were you like that as a teen too? Or did you sort of start to come out of that? Yeah, I came out of it. I think in elementary school, I was definitely one of the bad kids, <laughs> which I, I honestly think that's probably like very, um, it feels out of character today, to be honest. Um, but it, it, it was true. Um, and in high school, I think I started to, um, take like life and school and relationships more seriously and so I, I yeah I was like student council in high school so yeah I, I slid into like the good kid yes, <laughs> category yeah. I went from like one end of the spectrum to the other like following all the rules making the roles as a student or like a leadership um, council member or something like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm, I'd love to pivot into your work yeah, and your yeah. career I know that you started off in retail, mm -hmm. was where your career started. Yeah. Was this at the same time that you went off to post-secondary? Yeah, I I mean, I worked in retail. I've I've had a job as long as I can remember. I was like, I was a newspaper delivery kid um, when I was really, really young, which um, truth be told, I got a lot of help from my mom. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, this is when I said that she was too generous, like she definitely like, did the route for me a couple oh. of times, which is like horrible, but she did. <laughs> you know, that's just the truth. Where were you? I don't know. It's probably like like at a soccer practice or something. Like we we stick handled the job together. I'll I say. see. <laughs> yeah. But um, that was like my that was definitely my first job, and then I started working in retail in high school, but became 
like a reach like it became it became a career in university when I started um, in the management position at mm-hmm. Abercrombie and Fitch, which I was I was there for for many years. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. And I, when you were at Abercrombie, is that what you learned was this ability to manage people and take on leadership totally. roles? Yeah, I think that was. I mean, I don't know if this is still true, but when when I went through their manager and training program and became a manager. They were really um, well respected. The company was for that program and for um, helping to build, you know, managerial acumen, business acumen um, through like a really structured program. They had really high volume um, stores. We were we were managing million dollar businesses, just one store, right? And so um, I don't know if you remember um, back in like the early two thousands. I think it would have been when there were, like, lineups. We don't see this anymore, but lineups to get into an Abercrombie and Fitch. I do remember and the that. Hollister. I work for the Hollister brand, but they're all under one umbrella. Mm-hmm. And do you remember, like, there was massive lineups, yeah. like, down the street. It was, there's nothing like that today, like, from a retail perspective that I know of, other than, like, you know, if you're buying, like, Yeezys or, like, a, like a limited Yeah, like a drop, product. like a special yeah. drop. So all that to say, um, a lot of what I took away from that experience was this is how you manage complexity right like this is we have i think we had like 400 people that worked at our store at one point oh wow that's <laughs> yeah. a lot yeah and so yeah. there were like seven managers we were all kind of responsible for one part of the store and yeah i definitely learned um how to engage with like a bunch of different personality types different people's different needs and um and then also just to you know exist in chaos all the time like mm-hmm. working there was pure chaos at the time mm. Wow, what do you think it was about the Abercrombie? And this is now just yeah. I'm just getting just so curious about brand equity. Like, yeah. why <laughs> yeah. why do you think why do you think there were lineups down? Mm. How did they cultivate <laughs> that kind of brand that resulted in lineups down the block? So I have to be in? like careful about what I say here, but okay. I think there's um, a really good documentary. I think it was on Netflix called White Hot, and it's about Abercrombie and Fitch and their kind of rise and fall. So I would recommend well, everybody watch that. It's especially anyone that's like, I'm a millennial, I'm a mid, in my mid thirties. Like if you're around that age, like a lot of what they're looking at is the culture at the time and what the environment was that made a brand like that as popular white hot, right? Like mm. white hot is when a brand becomes like just incredibly popular <laughs> within, within the zeitgeist. And I think, you know, big part of it was just selling sex period to teenagers. Yeah. Like that's, it's like, it can be as simple as that. I, but, but I think, um, you know, if you were to dive a little bit deeper, I think they, you know, the CEO and the leadership team were, really marketing geniuses to be honest and they they didn't just sell sex they sold they sold it in a really um neat package it was really exclusive really aspirational um and they created like a really cool unique in-store experience i use the word cool in scare quotes but um it, like you would go into that store and it felt like you were going into a club and the music was blasting and like there was you know cologne being sprayed in your face <laughs> and yeah. so i think they good looking people who are really good looking there. people Qu- mm-hmm. scare quotes again around good looking by the way yes yes um and and yeah i think they they like executed at a really high level for a really long time and the culture was okay with that like if you inserted an abercrombie and fitch into 2022's culture it would like probably close like the, in the version that they existed 10 years ago it probably wouldn't last you know six months but at the time we were all really okay with like you know being sold what they were selling mm, so fascinating oh i have so many questions about that brand but yeah. i'm gonna i'm going to watch the documentary instead so I'm gonna it's put worth put it. you on the it's spot worth the time. here it's worth the time <laughs> yeah yeah and then you continued on with retail, and mm-hmm. that's that's what brought you to Vancouver because you got a job at a company called Indochino. Yeah, so that was kind of my transition out of like traditional retail into something different. And actually, one of my old colleagues from Abercrombie and Fitch was the one that brought me over. Her name's Jen Clark. Um, definitely changed my life <laughs> um, with that offer to come out and join the team at Indochino. And um, Indochino is. Uh, menswear brand um, and at the time they were really really heavily um, le- leaning really heavily into the kind of e-commerce space they had this um, unique algorithm that allowed them to produce a custom suit 
um, in four weeks with 14 measurements. So that was pretty revolutionary at the time. And um, I came to join their retail team, but for me, it was really an opportunity to um, expand my own kind of experience and, and um, skill set. So I was really excited about the tech side of the business and that it was like purely e-commerce and that, you know, ha- I think at the time, like half of the team were developers and, and designers. Like it was, the, it was really a tech company at the time. I don't know how they're operating today, but I, I think um, that was definitely the way that it was sold to me. It was, a, a, you want to come join this tech company. And so that was definitely my first um, step outside of just like these traditional brick and mortar businesses. Mm -hmm. And what did you learn about being at a tech startup? I I mean, I loved it. I think this, so it's funny, like this kind of tracks back to that like delinquent (laughs) in me. I think the thing about working at a startup that I really loved and still really enjoy is that there's a lot of freedom. Um, Failure is often celebrated or... If it's not celebrated, it's valued. And so there's a lot of experimentation and um, it, there's no playbook. Like there's really no, like, there's no employee manual. <laughs> there's, depending on how, how early you join a startup, there's like not even like an HR team. <laughs> it's like two people and maybe like, you know, contractors. So I think it's I really... Bootstrapping. Totally, yeah. Just like figuring it all out at once. And that was definitely my experience at Indochino, they were like fairly well funded. So we had more structure than a lot of the companies that I work with today, for example. I think that was, I think I was employee 50. Mm-hmm. So they had, they had a team, you know, and they, they did have, you know, an HR department, but I loved that, you know, everybody was just, you know, hitting above their weight in terms of like what you brought to the company and what you were expected to produce where there was like typically a pretty big chasm there and so everybody was in this like high growth mode even like internally like like their personal growth was happening on the job and and I really loved that like that element of startup life and and work and culture yeah I feel that when you're at a startup or something that is new and there's a very skinny team you learn to be super resourceful exactly resourceful and like wearing all the kind of different hats yeah and but there is so much, um, it's such an education. Maybe totally. that's the way I'll, Absolutely. I'll put it. Yeah. You just have to learn things that you may have not gone to school for. You're I mean, like, I just, I'm just going to learn this. Almost, I, I think unless you are in finance or like on the tech side of the business, everyone is doing things that they didn't do, go to school for at a startup for the most part. Like it's, it's highly creative. Like it's a very creative environment because... You know, you do have to be resourceful. You do have to, like, solve problems that you have never faced before. And nobody has time to help you. <laughs> so you have to, you're kind of, it's up to you to to sort it out. And and that, like, I think breeds a lot of creativity. Mm-hmm. And, and it's also not for everybody. <laughs> like, that that is, some people really need the, the structure and the rules and the, and the shape that, you know, um, a lot of, like, more, ma- more mature businesses are, are in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that have those those structures yeah. and systems yeah. that l- allow the ship to to fire and, and totally. move forward. I have a question. This is kind of like jumping from where what we're talking about back into your your family. But I'm curious to know because you were into you know being at a startup and and learning this way. Were your was your mom ever? Did your mom ever question, what are you doing? Because I feel that <laughs> immigrant parents, and I'm speaking from experience, they they don't get it yeah. when you do these sort of off-the-path, uh, when you take these off-the-path careers or, 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 you know, start to experiment in, in these ways. I, I typically feel like immigrant parents are like, get something steady, mm-hmm. be a lawyer, be a doctor, be an accountant. And I'm wondering if that happened to you. Well, you can see me grinning <laughs> <laughs> from ear to ear because, yeah, I was supposed to be a lawyer. That was the whole thing. Like, that was the plan. And I remember I was in pre-law in, in my undergrad. And I remember um, walking out of – and this, again, like again, like a little bit of a delinquent – but I remember just like walking out of the class and being like, I'm not in pre-law anymore <laughs> because I, we had this one really good, like informative seminar where a lawyer, like a 
practicing lawyer came in and spent, I think it was like two hours kind of telling us what it's like being a lawyer. And I was like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> that sounds horrible. Like that, not horrible, it was not for me. Um, I knew I wanted to do something that was more creative. Um, I wouldn't have used that language at the time, but I, that was like the feeling inside. I was like, I don't want to write contracts all day or, um, you know, be kind of billing hours um, to, you know, go into the details that other people don't want to go into. And like, that was kind of my understanding of um, what it meant to be a lawyer. And I think, um, you know, like pop culture sold me something differently when I joined university. I thought mm -hmm. it was pretty like litigating in court, like, you know, <laughs> making cool points. And, you know, after a couple of years of pre-law, I realized that that wasn't what, what that was going to be. So but yeah, the that was the plan. And I think um, fortunately, over the past, I'd call it like three to five years, big tech and technology have become, you know, the dominant um, workforce. Uh, I'd actually have to look that up um, from, like from a numbers perspective, but definitely the narrative is that big tech is where people work today. And so I think that helped me. And I think it's hopefully helping a lot of other immigrant children um, with like, uh, with the narrative to their parents, but it, it was always difficult. I think, um, you know, there were these certain moments where it would, I would see it like click for my mom or even like my extended family. Um, but they were more around just like, um, success milestones. Like mm. I was, I was, um, written about in Forbes and that, like, that was the moment where it clicked and like, okay, this is like a real thing that he's doing and it's not, um, you know, project. It's, it's something that, you know, an industry is taking seriously. But yeah, I think tech and startups is, it's like really high risk and it's really weird. And it's not what a lot of our parents came here to, you know, to do, to mm -hmm. take risks. Like it was, this was supposed to be a more secure path. And so, right. yeah, I think it's always been interesting. I do think though that when people of color are, you know, take up careers that maybe typically they wouldn't have been found in before, you know, you you can become like, you, you can become what you see, right? Yeah. So if there are people um, that are younger than you who see what you're doing, they can finally be like, oh, me too, I can do that. Yeah, and that, you know, honestly puts additional pressure <laughs> on um, that kind of first wave or the, the folks that are doing something um, you know, that a lot of people in their community don't necessarily understand. And it's, that pressure is welcome. Like, I think for me, I stepped into the world of venture capital and the world of, you know, um, startup, like this startup ecosystem um, with my eyes wide open. So it's not like that wasn't a surprise. But the truth is, is that it means the stakes are a bit higher for you because you, and, you know, not everybody in that situation is going to relate to this next statement, but I, like, I don't want to fail for that reason. Right. Because, um, I know that there are people who, you know, are looking at my trajectory or my path, um, as, you know, like a model. Um, so I think that that is just the reality of being, you know, one of the first to do something in an industry, um, and especially when you look at it from like a, an identity perspective, right? Like it's, it, because it, like everything in startups is net new. It's a startup because you're doing something new, right? So inherently you're like an outsider to some sort of an industry because you're doing something different. But if you're like a woman that's doing it or, you know, a person of color, a member of the LGBTQ community or all of those things, um, yeah, there's like then that other, <laughs> that other, um, piece of the puzzle that you have to consider. Right, right. I read when I was doing my research, <laughs> <laughs> I read an, an interesting term that had been used in one of the articles I read about you, and I'd love to dive into it. Mm. It's called code switching. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, maybe for people who don't understand that, what that yeah. is, um, it would be great to hear you know, your experience with yeah. having to do that. And then I wanted to loop it into something that I had recently read that really struck me but yeah I, I can get into that after after hearing you describe this yeah i mean code switching is the ability to 
kind of tap into different dialects or languages even, um, depending on the scenario. So um, a good example would be, you know, if you're like, if you're in the back of a taxi with like one person that speaks one language and the taxi driver speaks another language, you're like code switching (laughs) um, to send a message to this person and and then code switching again to send a message to the other person. That's like a very literal example that's actually probably like closer to just straight up translating but code switching in like the culture um is is really about understanding i think code switching like actually is the key to accessibility especially in the work that i do which is um you know we work in finance and so finance has a lot of um they call it financial literacy for a reason because you have to understand the language before you can really engage. Um, and there's a whole industry built off of having someone else manage your finances for you. Um, and so for, for me, I think code switching um, is like a, a really important tool to create more accessibility um, in certain industries. And then on a more kind of just like purely fun side of things, like I think of, you know, when I'm, you know, out on like Davy Street with my friends, I might use l- language and lingo that I would never use um, in other environments because I know that the community and the people in that in that environment know what know what I mean, <laughs> and, they, and they know what I'm saying mm-hmm. um, when I use like certain language. So, um, and I think you know, the Black community has been code switching for centuries, <laughs> um, and I think it's beautiful, and I think a lot of us like I can't speak for everybody obviously but I think we think it's beautiful it's like it's a skill that that you develop and you figure out how to like turn on a certain voice and turn it off depending on who is Mm. receiving the message right it's almost like this this ability to to chameleon to yeah exactly the right in environments yeah but not because you're trying to be fake but just so that Mm -hmm. you have a way to connect with a particular group that you're communicating or being with well i mean like i mean the roots of it are like based in survival right so like code switching um is not just i mean the modern version of it i think is way more complex but you can imagine many scenarios where folks had to had to speak a certain way (laughs) in order to stay alive or stay safe so Mm -hmm. yeah i think it is the the idea of like a chameleon is like the perfect the perfect metaphor for it, I think, actually. Mm -hmm. I read this really moving piece uh, on uh, Humans of New York. Mm -hmm. I I don't know if you you follow it. Uh, And I think this was last week, but it was this, um, it was a photo of this black man. And he was talking about a recent incident where he had been on a plane and he turned to the person beside him who happened to be, uh, I think, a fairly uh, famous Broadway producer. And they were talking about, I think he was talking about a new Broadway show. And this fellow, who was the subject of Humans of New York, asked, how was it? And the producer had made some kind of comment on, well, and sometimes we have to produce shows Mm -hmm. uh, around marginalized or underrepresented people, even if they're not good. And and this person was like, had the wind knocked out of him. No kidding. You know? Yeah. And he was actually headed to a climate summit that he was part of. Um, and he said that when he walked into the room, he said there, ha- there is this five minute, um, there's this five minute period, he says, where he has to do extra labor. Because yeah. when he walks into that room, yeah. he has to go from being who he, who he is and know mm-hmm. who he is, to walk into that room and start saying, he starts to say to himself, do I belong here? Am I smart enough? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And then after that five minutes, he's able to sort, sort of settle into himself. But he yeah. said, there's an extra five minutes of labor yeah. that other people don't need to do. Totally. I, like, I think it's, this might even be a coping mechanism, but I don't think of it as la- labor, but I know that it is. Like, I know that, that that's true, but I try to see the beauty and the ability to do, to fit into certain environments and um and and look at it as like a skill set but I think you're I mean that's all all absolutely true it is labor and I think um 
yeah, when I when I, I've done a lot of thinking about code switching and um, and and about just how like the extra work that um, people of color or just any marginalized group needs to do to you know get a seat at the table or get their voice heard. Um, and and I think you know there's a really deep impact that that has on us. And I, I can you know say that for myself, I excuse me, I've um, I've wondered before, you know, if like in another world where I didn't have to do that, would I have like would these certain parts of my personality exist or? What would they, you know, like who would I be in another, you know, in another environment? Universe, so, yeah. yeah, exactly. But oh, it's interesting. Yeah. Have you ever thought of what you feel like you might be like? <laughs> no, I, I don't actually like go down that. Road <laughs> okay. Like, yeah. It's it's kind of a fleeting thought because I think, um, yeah, I'm more interested in the here and now. That's just me. Mm. Um, maybe that'll change over time. It's almost kind of like not worth investigating to mm -hmm. me because that's not the world we live in. So, you know, might as well move on. I think that there's also like maybe a little bit of pain there as well, like thinking about what might, what could have been, but you know, all of that is wrapped in the, the other fact that I'm, I love who I am today. So it's like, you know what I mean? Like it's um, not necessary. I'm not like motivated to go and investigate that, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. No, no, I, I totally hear that. And, um, I'm wondering how you found this world. How how did you get into the VC world yeah. and learning about angel investing? Mm -hmm. and what brought you there? You know, like it was kind of by accident. And funny enough, I like I I think venture capital. There there are some parallels actually to. Um, legal practice <laughs> um, like even the structure like it's you know you've got your partners and your associates and um, but there's there's definitely like the the day-to-day -day work is quite different but um, I yeah I ended up in venture capital just as like um, a natural conclusion to the set of experiences that I had since I moved to Vancouver really so I had worked in operational roles in startups for about four or five years and then um, I landed a role at League of Innovators. At the time, it was called The Next Big Thing. And so um, that is and was a nonprofit that, is cent that was centered around um, enabling uh, n uh, new generations of entrepreneurs. So we really focused on young entrepreneurs, um, folks that were 30 and under. And I ran a program. Um, an accelerator program that essentially did exactly that, just enabled them to get from like point A to point B. And after running that program for a few years, I became really, really interested in the financing side of startup building and venture building because what I would, I saw these patterns that are so obvious to me now, but I think I was just kind of discovering them for the first time back then um, of, you know, these awesome entrepreneurs, um, tons of diversity in terms of like their background, um, the ideas that they were building, the goals that they had for themselves. But um, there was always this point that, you know, there were like external factors that would either like prevent them or allow them to continue. And those were all capital <laughs> um, based factors. And it was typically this kind of like what I, what I saw at the time, like this small group of decision makers, investors, <laughs> that at a certain point, you know, a, an entrepreneur needs to go get capital and they would, um, you know, go to investors and they would get a yes or a no and then their trajectory would be changed. So that's kind of how I ended up in VC. I got really interested in that. And then um, I, I joined a Toronto-based venture capital firm um, in 2019 and never really looked back. I, I really, um, I'm really in, enjoying kind of the work that I get to do in this space. And obviously that's evolved um, over the past few years since I started my own uh, my own company um, and yeah I'm happy to tell you a little bit more yes yes you launched it in 2020 no? yeah. yeah 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 and just 
the next big thing. Yeah. I believe um, there was someone I know who worked there, Meredith Powell. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, I, yes. I haven't seen her in years, <laughs> but I remember that she had been there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just caught up with Meredith a couple of weeks ago, so it's oh, funny. Yeah, that's for amazing. many years. Oh, yeah. I wonder how she's – is she doing great? Yeah, she's good. She's okay. a baby. Oh, she did? <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That. That, that's – it is it is a small small world. And it the is. world of adventure is, is really small. Even, like, beyond Vancouver, I think – um there's yeah this small group of people um that are in in this um community or ecosystem and that's actually something we're trying to change at future capital we're trying to kind of break it wide open and make it more accessible Mm -hmm. yeah so tell me more about about future capital i know that it's also very educational yeah so financial literacy education is really kind of at the core of everything we do and um the idea was really born out of my experience coming into the world of venture capital I, I think I came in with you know a lot of um, relevant experience and relevant knowledge but I still didn't really know like how the transactions were done or how the you know funds were structured um, how do you make a decision um, like how does an investor make a decision and I felt at the time, and that that feeling has been like affirmed over the the you know past few years that that um, lack of knowledge gave other people a lot of power over me <laughs> in the industry. So just not knowing how things were done um, meant that I had to let someone else decide on my behalf, or or that I I just didn't really get to my my opinion was less valuable, um, and so you know. That inspired me to, you know, create a course on venture capital and a course on angel investing. Um, it's called Foundations and Startup Investing. We launched that course in uh, the spring of 2020. This was before I even incorporated. Um, I did it out in the open at the firm, and I said, "Hey, I'm doing this thing. I think it's going to really help with our diversity goals." And and you know if. It, we need to put ourselves into the mindset of 2020 and what was going on in 2020. And diversity was the only thing that corporate leaders were like basically allowed to talk about. It was like, shut up. If you're not talking about diversity, nobody right. wants to listen to yeah, you. Get on board. Yeah. Unfortunately that's changed. Um, and people are talking about a lot of other things, but um, yeah, at the time I was, I, 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 I kind of like seized the opportunity to go do this under the guise of like building, you know, a more diverse cohort of investors. And um, yeah, we were really successful and, and successful enough that in uh, the summer of 2020, I, I um, incorporated. And, and I think the thing that people really responded to um, and continue to respond to is um, that we just try to make this really veiled and sometimes co- overly complex industry more um, approachable. And code switching, again, um, comes into the work that we do because I think a lot of it is just teaching people the language. And that's that's really kind of like how we introduce and frame up what we do to learners um, is we're just going to teach you the language, language of venture capital. We're going to teach you, you know, how to, how to you know, um, understand the core concepts and you do with that what you mm-hmm. will. Yeah, yeah I, I, I feel like... When you have those foundations, people can't talk circles around you anymore because you know what's going on. Yeah, a lot of, I mean, like that imposter syndrome is something that's so ever present in finance. And I think, I think in, in certain, um, there are good examples of conversations where even I like wouldn't know what I was talking about and that imposter syndrome is validated. And I know that's like controversial to say, but like, I think. Um, a good example. I don't know if you've ever seen the show Industry on HBO. No. Okay, this show is amazing. I'm recommending it to all of your listeners because it's so good. But it's about, you know, these like Wall Street type, um, you know, bankers in London. And there's a level of sophistication that even that goes over, over my head. <laughs> and I've worked in finance now for many years. Um, and so I think, you know, there are certain like levels of like complexity and certain concepts that you do really need you know, experience and, um, you know, a ton of education to master and really understand, but that's not at the level that most investors need to get to. Like, you don't need to, like, um, you know, understand, you know, the deepest financial engineering to 
just make an investment. You need to understand the basics. And so that's kind of where where we meet people um, and, and allow them to kind of go deeper or, or not from there. Mm. I actually really love this because you don't, maybe you don't necessarily have to want to be a, like an angel investor or anything. This mm-hmm. is actually just good for any entrepreneur yeah, exactly. or anyone who wants to have financial literacy. Like I'm yeah. listening to you right now. I'm like, should I do this course? I mean, uh, you're very it probably, <laughs> it'd probably be really, really helpful for me as an entrepreneur yeah. doing what I'm doing with a craft and doing with what I'm doing with my sound therapy practice to understand how this system works. Like yeah. uh, I was reading that, um, you know, there's three different levels that you speak to. There's the angel, the LP, and the syndicate levels. Yeah. And I'm like, what is what it? Even this is even, what, yeah. is, what is this? I didn't <laughs> even know that there were these different levels. And so what are these levels? Yeah, no, I, I love the question. And I think um, I, you can see, like, I get, I light up when I start to talk about you this do. and start to educate <laughs> because I think it's just so useful. And it's not just for investors. It's we talk about it as like um, a program and really like a you know a community for operators. So like highly skilled operators, people that are in business that are ambitious and want to do something, um, you know, and have an impact. And I think this this you know uh, information um, and this type of education can enable anyone that you know identifies with that. Um, angel investor, I'll, I'm going to do a little bit of like, yeah, educating right now. So angel investor is just an individual who invests directly into a business. So typically someone that invests into a high growth venture at a really early stage. So before the company has like, like found their their product market fit or like proof of concept, um, they'll have angel investors that say like, I believe in this idea. I believe in you. Go do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what does high growth venture mean? So So yeah, yeah. Uh, so you want to think of it as something that is that is really capital intensive, intensive um, to grow. Something that is like, something like a rocket ship. Um, so a good example would be, um, do you know, Smart Suites. Yes, I always yeah. use a Smart Suite example because yeah. I love Tara. I love the business she built. I, she actually went through the program that I ran. No way. Um, what a success I take, story! I take zero credit for it though because <laughs> it's all yeah. Like she is but a still. success story for sure. Um, but they grew from like zero to a 300 and some like $60 million sale in four years. Like that's high growth. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, crazy. And, and the brand presence at retail stores, I see it everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, there's, they're a good example of like a non-tech product, but a lot of tech companies take that high, high growth trajectory. And it's essentially something that can go from like zero to a sale or an acquisition or, or like a IPO, um, like go to get on the public market within like. 10 years. So mm. that's kind of the framework. That's how I think of high growth. A lot of businesses are growing and growing fast, but they're not necessarily, uh, their objective isn't some sort of an exit. Their I see. objective isn't to sell it or to get out of the business or cash out. It's it's essentially to build something that they can run for, you know, a lifetime or for generations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. And then let's go back to the LP yeah, and the yeah, syndicate yeah. levels too. Yeah. So we, I explained what an angel investor is. A limited partner is an individual that in, invests into a fund, which is a larger pool of capital. Um, you, funds have professional managers. So they're like professional like wealth managers. They don't call themselves wealth managers, but essentially you're saying, hey, you know, fund manager, I'm going to give you, you know, a few thousand dollars. You go make it. Make, make smart decisions yeah. now with it. The the benchmark for fund investing is really high. So um, as an angel investor, you can invest like $5,000, $10,000. As a fund investor, you typically have to be 25K or up. Sometimes it's up to like mm. a million is like the minimum. So it's not as accessible right. for the general public. And then a syndicate is just a smaller, more nimble version of a fund. So yeah, it's it's just a lighter weight fund. So you might have like a syndicate with like five friends and Oh, I see. Yeah, you okay. you all pull together like two, three, four, five, ten thousand dollars and that, that makes, you know, a, a larger investment than you can invest together. Got it. So is something like SoftBank and mm-hmm. LP? SoftBank bank is a fund and they have tons of really rich LPs. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm kind of nerdy. I'm not I'm I wouldn't call myself ever an expert or completely literate in this in this space but I've always been really interested so yeah. from I don't know young 20s I I like reading New York Times deal awesome. book oh nice. um so nice. yeah, yeah. so yeah uh, so okay so soft bank 
yeah. LP. I, I know super, I mean, they, they were investing in like Airbnb and yeah. Um, I think sorry, no, th- we work. I think they're, yes. And they just reinvested in him, which is yes, I know, I read so that. fascinating, but that's yeah. for another, <laughs> another yeah. conversation. But I think soft Inc. is still the biggest fund in the world. So that's, yeah, they're, they're, okay. if they aren't, they're like up there number two or, um, are but, they reinvest investing to save face from what happened? Like, I'm not going to gonna touch like, that. Okay. I'm not going to touch it. Yeah. I, I, I'm not going <laughs> to presume to know why they are reinvesting. Right. Okay. And I, and I can't even make a guess to be completely yeah, honest. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I've always been curious. Yeah. I, I thought that was interesting as well. I, th- I think the, the other thing too, though, that makes this conversation more relevant is that trajectory of like big tech as this, you know, like there are so many examples for people now of what a startup can turn into like Uber, Google, like all of these big tech companies started at Facebook, started as startups. And um, those are exceptions to the rule. I think it's really, really rare that companies go to that level. But even like um, Bumble, for example, like mm-hmm. that was a huge startup success story. Um, and I think it's just becoming more common, you know, for us to engage with startups and technology and high growth ventures in one way or another, um, including like being employed by a startup. I think a lot of people are moving into startup work. Um, and that I think makes this the conversation that we kind of started in 2020 more relevant today, which is, you know, exciting for us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, you're right. Bumble is a great success story because it started off as one thing, which yeah. it still is, yeah. but it's got so many different branches yeah. that they've <laughs> created and it's almost kind of hard to, to keep up, but they've done really some interesting things with it. Uh, I know some friends that have used Bumble friends when they moved oh, to new cities and have found friends. And it works. That really? It works. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. I have a friend that moved here from Hong Kong and her husband is, uh, it was originally from here, but they had been living in Hong Kong for a long time and they moved back in 2021 and she used Bumble friends and cool. found some friends. Nice. Like, wow, this thing actually works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Which that's is cool. Great. Yeah. Um, let's talk about equity yeah. in, in this space. You're doing a lot of work to make this space more diverse because I know you and I were, t- were chatting uh, last week, I think, and I was saying to you that what I notice in the podcast space that a lot of people who get really big deals or funding are straight white males and they get lots of deals from Spotify and and this and that. And then there's a few females that, that may get funding as well, but it's mostly that first cohort. And I think you and I were just talking about, it would be lovely to see more Mm -hmm. maybe POCs getting these types of deals or just being able to have a bigger piece of, the the pie that's out of there that's out there um for people who have are talented and have communities totally this is like it's a really steep uphill battle i'd say um where equity is concerned for underrepresented communities because um you you can think of like finance as like one of the oldest vestiges of like a patriarchal system um and I, i only laugh out of like discomfort because it's like it's tough. Like it's really tough. There's there's just too much data to even come through that just shows you how um, inequitable even venture capital is. And venture capital is like this newer um, financial industry. Like it's not like Wall Street um, where it has you know like decades upon decades upon decades of experience in these like entrenched norms. Venture capital has really only been around as long as tech has been around. So about like. 40 years um, and it's still deeply it mirrors um, you know the demographics of a lot of other really old industries and so it's a really really steep uphill battle Um, but the way that we I mean so the way that I like to think about it is like if you have (laughs) more diverse um, there's actually like a really basic business case for more diversity at, at like every level of business. And so if you have more diverse um, founders, product managers, investors, um, you know, senior leadership in your companies, you're probably going to build products and services for a more diverse demographic, AKA bigger. <laughs> so mm-hmm. you're going to, you're actually going to build better businesses. And there's a lot of um, data that supports 
that as well. It's also very, very common sense. <laughs> I mean, you don't really have to dig into data, but if you want to, you can do that to like get a deeper understanding. But um, you know, I, I really believe that more diversity is better for everybody. It's like that um, old saying of like rising tide lifts all boats. Um, but unfortunately, especially in finance, there is the industry is like really slow to make those um, those structural like systemic changes. I think we had like a flash in the pan in 2020 and a lot of declarations and a lot of um, you know well-intentioned um, initiatives that were you know started to really move the needle but people are fairly self-interested in, in finance and in business. And, and I think um, that, that makes it really, really hard to, to shift, um, to shift those, those numbers in, in a meaningful kind of like permanent way. So, mm. yeah, I think, you know, equity is always, it's like at the core of what we're trying to change. And um, we, we just want to essentially create a world where there are no underrepresented founders, like nobody's underrepresented. Right. <laughs> um, there's no un underrepresented investors. Um, but that's, yeah, that's going to be a really long journey for, for us and for, for all of the other organizations and individuals who support that mission. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which in a way is kind of mind blowing because, you know, the world is so diverse. Yeah. Like this, the industry should be a reflection of totally. the world and it's not. Yeah, that's, I mean, it is, that is like the one thing that does kind of baffle me is it does feel like common sense to, to me. Um, it really does. Like I think... I think of all of the products for, I'll get like really specific for like, like hair care products for black women, right? Think about like, if we put the full weight of like the economy into, you know, producing like <laughs> really great products for that demographic, like there's a whole like new industry that gets created or born or expanded mm -hmm. by by just shifting focus and putting like the right amount of resources into um that product set and so like for me like as like as a business person and as an investor like why wouldn't you want to do that right um so that part is a little bit baffling to me sometimes mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah so you have to be like but re regardless of whether or not i'm baffled like the ch there's just like a lot of evidence that that's the way it is so we have we have just kind of chosen to be really intentional about how we're creating, you know, a new system um, or not even creating a new system, just expanding the existing system and making sure that, you know, the people that we get get to work with and that we're injecting into those decision making roles have, um, you know, a, a fuller understanding of what's possible and, mm. and have a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know if you feel that in order to be a good investor, yeah, um, is this something that is natural to some people and is innate? Can it mm. be learned through That's going through question. through education, or do mm. some people have like this natural intuitive instinct for knowing like that's <laughs> going to pop off, and I yeah. need to to invest in this person, product, service now? That's such a good question, and. I don't think I have the answer, but I have an answer, like, excuse me, my own perspective. I think there are a few people that I know, a few, a small few people who I think of as like a bellwether, <laughs> who I'm like, I'm going to follow that person because mm. they have that, um, A, like a track record that shows that they have a, a really good idea of like what makes a startup successful or what makes a good founder. Um, but I, I would be really hesitant to say that even those people will be right 100% of the time. Like, I think investing is what you want to analyze more than, you know, your ability to, like, do your due diligence or, like, spot a winner is your risk profile. So, like, it's, like, how much of a stomach do you have for failure and for, like, losing money? I think that's, like, uh, probably a more important question to ask and answer for like nine out of 10 investors. And then like that one out of 10 is going to be that person that can just follow their gut and do really, really well. Uh, that All of that said, I do think there is like a set of standards that once you, you like the individual understand, it'll, it can help you to um, 
be decisive as an investor. Like just there's just some basics, like like foundations, as as the title of our course suggests, that once you have those and you understand and can appreciate like the the basics of like, you know, like what do you need to see? Um, what are some, you know, red flags? Um, what are some of the patterns that um, successful founders follow um, that will help you to just be more decisive? But yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. It's like, I could probably talk about that forever. And, and I think there's a lot, of, a lot of different perspectives on, on the answer to that question, to be honest. Mm-hmm, you know? mm-hmm. I'm wondering if it's kind of like um, charisma. You know, some people are yeah. naturally charismatic and they just ooze it and they've been oozing it for a while. Mm-hmm. But if you go onto YouTube, there's tons of videos that yeah. can educate you on how to develop charisma. That's interesting. Oh, really? And yeah, yeah. Mm. And it's and it's certain tweaks that you can make, like um, by being a better listener, mm-hmm. uh, by sharing a little bit about yourself. Like just these little <laughs> tips, like, yeah. oh, wow, <laughs> everyone can be, very, can be charismatic. Yeah. Like, but again, some people just have have it naturally and they're magical people yeah um but yeah it's something that can also be taught well i was i was actually talking to someone one of uh, this woman who took our, our program and um just like wanted to get some advice and she she said to me like you know i really like the financial side um and the analytical side of this industry but the relationship building side which is which is a big part of it you have to know you have to know like you can be the best at like assessing a deal and like assessing a founder. But if you don't have access to them, like if you don't know the person, like you can't invest. Right. So you Mm -hmm. have to have those relationships. And she said that the relationship side of it was really taxing, like really draining. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have like a good answer for her because she was like, do you think there's like a way or a role for me um, in this world that doesn't require that much relationship building? And I I, I don't really think there. Yeah. I didn't want to say there's no space for you, but like, I don't know. Like I just, I haven't seen many examples. I think that's a big part of it. So you have to be able to like earn people's trust. (laughs) You have to be able to show value. Like it's just like any other relationship that you build. It's kind of like life. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Your life is much fuller when you have great relationships in it, you know, no matter how few or many. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's so, that's really, what an interesting question she posed to you. Yeah. It, yeah, it definitely stumped me. <laughs> yeah. I feel stumped too. I'm like, yeah. I, yeah, I probably would say the same thing. I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a couple more questions. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So if someone is really interested in becoming more financially literate, what kind of advice would you give them or what kind of actionable next steps can they take to become that? more yeah i mean depending on what area of finance i want to become literate in i think the advice would need to be tailored but i think one thing that's all that's really worked for me um to develop my own uh financial literacy over the years is finding sources of media or content that is genuinely interesting to me um but centered around like um an area or an industry that i don't know much about and Um, absorbing that I find like podcasts to be like really good um, ways to absorb information it's not it's fairly passive right like you're not like sitting there taking notes on a podcast for the most part I hope nobody's doing that right now (laughs) (laughs) Um, but I think it's a really casual way of like like I said just learning the language and like understanding what how how people um, talk and think about certain concepts so um, an example for me would be um, there's a podcast called Pivot, um, uh, and it's hosted by Kara Swisher and Scott Galloway, and they talk about like big market, um, you know, changes, um, and they often dive into, you know, the financial side, like what the deals look like and who's involved in the deal, and I find that to be like a really good like over the years. That's been a really good way for me to just like absorb like absorb information and absorb language um so that it's not foreign to me um so yeah i think media is a really good way to do it um and it doesn't have to be a podcast it can be you know like um an audiobook it could be a book it could be youtube videos like wherever you're already spending your time it could honestly be social media even though i think social media is a really bad place to educate um because our attention spans are like garbage on social media. And I think if you really want to learn something, you got to go deeper. But 
start wherever, right? Like start wherever makes sense for you and then try to get deeper than, than there. I think at a certain point though, like if you want to become literate in something, you need to actually educate yourself and like, mm-hmm. um, it doesn't need to be like our course, doesn't need to be a course, but you need to actually commit to like an extended period of time where you're actually going to come out the other side with like no, like knowledge about something specific yeah. yeah yeah and probably sitting with people who are in the space that are For willing sure. to to help you yeah definitely mm. definitely I think I think um immersion is the best mm. the best way to educate I took I tried to learn French until grade 12 but I never went to French immersion and never stuck <laughs> and I tried like I really yeah really tried and I think yeah if you're not immersed in it it's like really hard to um, develop any level of like comfort or like expertise with the language oh yeah a hundred percent I was I had a coffee with um, someone the other day and she's Japanese and I was telling her that before I went to Japan on a trip in 2018 I took beginner Japanese okay. just because I'm just I wanted to yeah, and yeah, yeah. somehow it felt respectful to totally, to do yeah. that before I went there uh, and again I would have loved to learn the language fully and uh, fluently conversationally yeah. maybe I should say yeah yeah but I knew that unless I had someone in my world that was Japanese that I could speak That's to so all the hard. time it would just it you know I, I'm not sure I would have been able I don't think I'll be able to develop that yeah um, so yeah I totally get that uh, one more question about um, the fine, like it, it, the finance industry. Before I, I ask something more personal, uh, but if someone who is looking for an investor, what what makes a good investor? Mm. What should they be looking out for? Because you're not, they're not just saying yes to you. Yes. You're saying yes to them Such as an well. Important question. Yeah, that is always going to be true. I think depending on, I don't, I don't necessarily like to like propagate the myth that. Uh, every founder is in total choice of like who their investor is because I think especially for underrepresented founders we have like less access to generational wealth by and large and typically you have to you have to you have less negotiating power in some of those those rooms but I think you're you're absolutely right that that there is you know um, a two-way street that exists between investors and founders and I think what you don't want in an investor as a founder is someone that doesn't actually believe in you. So I think you you want to make sure that um, anyone that ever invests into your your business um, is someone that's like uh, on your team, <laughs> like someone that wants you to succeed and that is a champion for you as an individual because um, what you want to avoid is someone that um, isn't, you know, a hundred percent committed or, or certain, or like totally excited about, you know, you as, as a founder. Cause if they, if they don't believe in your capacity, your ability, your vision, um, it's going to be really easy for them to waver in the future. And that's a headache that you never really want. Um, so I think that's like a really, really big key to success as, as a founder or entrepreneur is, um, working with investors that have like shared values, um, people that get what you're doing and that believe that you are the one that can do it. Mm. Yeah. And we'll give you the time to mentor you. I think sometimes, sometimes, yeah, sometimes no, to be honest. Yeah. Because I think, first of all, you can only like get so much mentorship in a week or in a month. Right. So you don't need every investor to be hands on. In fact, I think you want to be really calculated about how open those doors are. Mm. Because if you say to, you know, 50 investors, um, you know, the door is open, you can chat with me anytime, like hop on a call. Um, I need your help. Like, you're just like, you just will run out of time (laughs) to do that and energy. And like, your job is really to go out and build the business. So I think um, if you if you have someone that has like deep expertise, deep knowledge in, in an area that is really gonna help you in, the, in your business um, and they're an investor and they can be a mentor, that's a bonus, but that doesn't, I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, mm. I think you wanna be really careful about um, 
inviting too much mentorship from investors because investors ha have lots of ideas and opinions. Yeah, right? I was just thinking that as you were saying that. I'm like, oh, but that's also why they invest in you is because they believe in you yeah. to carry forth like how it should be done. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. kind of maybe too many cooks in the kitchen if the exactly. doors are, are exactly. open. Oh, okay. I, I, yeah, I'm just piecing that together together now. Um, one personal question that I want to ask is, you know, you were just sharing that you lost your mother and uh, thank you for being so open and sharing that. And having had to move myself through the grief process before losing people in my life, how, how are you taking care of yourself in this grief process at the moment? I am really leaning into um, the different communities that existed for, for me before this kind of life-changing event and that I believe will exist um, into the future. So for me, I'm like, I'm really not um, that great at asking for help. Um, it's just never been a strength of mine, but I'm doing a lot of that right now. Yeah, mm. just like for simple things or more complex things, just trying to, um, yeah, like allow people to be there for me um, where I can. Um, and I'm also doing a lot of um, like reading uh, about grief. And um, I think one of the things that I already knew but I'm relearning right now is that um, the idea that there are like seven stages of grief um, and that they're linear is like a total myth. And so for every individual, their process is going to be their process. Um, and so I think just trying to accept kind of where I'm at from day to day, um, which is really hard, especially, uh, you know, um, as an entrepreneur, because sometimes you have to be somewhere that you're not um, mentally or emotionally. So just practicing a lot of acceptance and um, allowing, you know, my friends and honestly, like my chosen family to yeah, be there and, and like love me and show show um, show that in whatever way they want to or they can. That's that's how I'm taking care of myself right now. Mm. Yeah, we're not meant to do this life alone. So I think that's really beautiful that you're allowing others to to be there for you at this time and and uh, yeah know that I'm also here as well like, well that's really I, sweet yeah. <laughs> I know what that I, I well. know how the grief process feels and you're right it's uh it's not the same for everyone and quite honestly it doesn't ever disappear yeah so yeah and also accepting that totally. it comes in waves totally I think um just I, like I, again like just acceptance is like the the word that keeps coming to mind for me as of late and in a lot of different ways but mostly just accepting like the realities of what life has thrown <laughs> in my direction and trying to find like some peace and eventually even some gratitude um that's that's a hard thing to do when you're like experiencing um like grief and trauma in such an acute way um like being grateful I think that might be like honestly decades until I can do that um but the acceptance piece I can start to work mm -hmm. on now mm -hmm. what would you like your mom to know right now oh boy <laughs> um oh I I've said this already um since she passed and um, I've like shared it publicly and, you know, um, just that I'm really proud to be her son. I think that's, that's what I'd like her to know. Mm. My final question that I ask everyone, well, first, actually, I should say, if people want to connect with you, where can they find you? Oh, um, 
I think LinkedIn LinkedIn is like a really good place to find me if if it's work related <laughs> um, or you know anything related to anything. You can find me anywhere for anything, but LinkedIn and Instagram are two good channels to find me. Don't text me even if you have my number. <laughs> I'm not good at texting, um, and don't call me. I won't. I won't answer. I don't, I don't answer the phone. <laughs> Um, but those two platforms are good. Yeah. <laughs> or try to reach him telepathically. <laughs> yeah. Or just say hi. Like, and, yeah, just say hi. I, li- I love like meeting new people. So. Amazing. And so my final question with what you do, what is it that you want to leave behind in the world? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a good, like a good, hard question. Um, and something that, you know, probably evolve over time, but as it stands, to be honest, I just want to like, <laughs> um, leave a positive impact on like the people that um I get the opportunity to like meet and work with and and know and so I know it's like super broad and vague but it's true like I think I just I yeah I want to make people's lives like a little bit better um on on any level that I can so if I if I can do that then I'm satisfied at Mm -hmm. the end of the day I love that well You've made my life a little bit brighter now that I know you. So I I hope to continue this new friendship. Me too. Oh my gosh. Thank <laughs> you so much for saying that. And thank you for having me. This is of been course. So thank wonderful. you. Thank you for your time. I learned so much and I really enjoyed this conversation. And yeah, I can't wait to till we meet again. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. As always. Thank you for being here and for listening. To learn more about today's guest, visit the episode page for show notes and links on wearethecraft.com. You can find the entire podcast archive here or explore more conversations with past guests on Spotify and Apple. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button on these platforms, including YouTube, to get notified when new episodes drop. Any likes and shares on social media are deeply appreciated too. Sound and audio engineering for the show are by Andrew and Jay Bagaspis. All guest portraits and images are by Juno Kim. Appreciate you all and see you again soon.